Welcome everyone to this Veterans Day event. Um, I know it's not Veterans Day itself, but we are honoring uh, our veterans a little bit early so that on the day itself, they have a chance to celebrate in their own ways. I'm so on honored to be moderating this wonderful panel this evening. My name is Jessica Lang and I'm the Interim Dean of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences. And I am delighted to welcome all of you here and to especially welcome our three panelists today as we take some time to celebrate and remember the service contributions and achievements of our veterans. Today's event will start with our panel. I will introduce our panelists and President Wu before they speak. And each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes about their experiences and also about how their experiences have impacted their current work. We have a few audience members who will speak briefly after our panelists. And then the floor will be open to questions. I want to invite audience members to email me to, through the chat, using the chat function, to uh, chat me questions at any point during our program. You do not have to wait until our Q&A session to send me your thoughts and questions. And I'll, I'll facilitate our discussion by reading your questions and allowing our esteemed guests to respond. Our first speaker, Tanya Domi, will have to leave uh, after her presentation because she's teaching this evening. And we're just so delighted to have her um, to have her for, for the time that we do have her for. Um, I want to take a moment to thank my colleagues and partners in putting together this evening's event uh, in, in the Weissman Dean's office, Beth Harpaz Anthony, and Anthony Mira, in the President's office, Anita Dwyer, um, and other colleagues who have made this evening possible both in the President's office and the Weissman Dean's office. It really does take a village to pull everything together. And Farouk is just such a wonderful village. So my thanks to you all. And now I want to introduce our first panelist, which is Tanya Domi. Tanya served in the US Army as a commissioned and non-commissioned officer for 15 years, rising to the rank of captain before leaving to serve in a number of leadership positions, including as a congressional defense policy analyst and working on democratic trans transitional projects in Albania, Armenia, Georgia, Haiti, Kosovo, Montenegro, Nepal, Serbia, the Gambia, the Philippines, and South Sudan. Tanya has worked internationally for more than a decade on issues related to democratic transitional development, including political and media development, human rights, gender and sexual identity issues, and human trafficking. She's expanded her research to include EU integration of Western Balkan countries and NATO enlargement in the region. Currently, Tanya is on the faculty of Columbia University, Hunter College, and the CUNY Graduate Center, where she dedicates her research and teaching interests to the Balkans and the states of the former Soviet Union. Tanya is also the host for the Thought Project podcast and a senior fellow at Alliance for Peacebuilding. Tanya, welcome to Baruch. We are so honored to have you. And I know that you'll have to leave after this program, but you very generously offered to share your your contact information with audience members should anyone have questions that they wish to send you at some later point. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Ling. And I would like to thank President David Wu and all the, the staff, including my colleague, Beth Harpaz, for putting this together. I wanna thank Baruch College for this tribute and remembrance of veterans. Um, so many times, uh, women are actually not seen as being veterans. And I can't tell you how many times women mentioned that when they park in a veteran's parking space, they're questioned as an example, like, why are you parking there? But, but despite all of that, um, the, army, the army changed my life entirely for good, for many, many good reasons. And when I enlisted in the army in 1974, I'm a Vietnam era vet, um, women were prohibited from bearing arms by law. But by the time I left in 1990, uh, women had been on the green ramp for deployment to Grenada in 1989, and they fought in combat advancing infantry troops with the military police in desert storm. That's a reflection of our broader society because at the same time, America was changing and the military does for the most part represent the, the demographic of America, except maybe from a class standpoint where those who are well off don't, don't 
exercise that option to volunteer. That's not always true, but it is, it is part of the military population. I would say that uh, not only did it change so much by 1990, in recent years, I had worked after I got out of the army and was congressional aid, I worked on utilization of women in the military, including uh, the reversal of the 1941 ban on women in co uh, combat aircraft. I actually wrote the, the report language that ended that prohibition even though women had been test pilots since World War II. Um, and now we have seen women enter the combat arms uh, in 2013, and they fought with valor in many instances in the Afghan and Iraq wars. Most recently, women were not only qualified as Rangers, one of the most uh, prestigious uh, tabs uh, that you wear in the army, but also a woman in this past week qualified in the army as a sniper the first time ever. So I, I have to say that I used to make a joke when I was a young soldier, be all they will let you be. Now you really can be all you can be as a woman. It has really dramatically changed. But what really reshaped my life in a profound way was in 1974, as a 19-year-old, I began to recognize that I was gay. In 1974, it had only been five years after Stonewall. And in that, that moment, there were no gay studies. There were no gay community centers. And there was actually, when I looked it up in Webster's, I remember I recall the name of the novel, A Room of One's Own. And in fact, the idea that one once realizing would commit suicide. Not only did I realize I was gay, the first time I went to a gay bar as a 19 year old in Boston, and I will never forget the name of that bar, The Lost and Found, I was turned in the Monday following that weekend to security investigators. I was Mirandized and I was charged with Article 125 violation of sodomy. I knew because I had been an activist in high school that I was going to call the ACLU. And that's exactly what I did. And I got lawyers, not only for myself, but for a number of my colleagues. To this day, the witch hunt that took place at Fort Devon, Massachusetts in 1974 through the mid 70s is considered the most extensive investigations of women who are gay ever in the US Army. But fast forward, I survived because I secured legal representation. And in 1993, I testified before the House Armed Services Committee explaining what happened to me in the military, in the Army, and why the Congress needed to change that discrimination. And 17 years later, I was in the White House for a ceremony led by then President Barack Obama when he signed the reversal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That it was profoundly changed my life. It changed my life to become, first of all, a advocate and an activist at the national level. And I brought it into my scholarship as a professor, and I have also become an internationally recognized human rights advocate. So I have much to thank the military for, even though I certainly did suffer. I would say that I didn't suffer as much as many people did. There are a number of my colleagues that deeply suffered. They were given derogatory uh, discharges. They suffered economically. People are devastated. Many people have survived PTSD and lived with it for years. But I consider, again, what I said about women in America, now the army really does look like all of us in that now LGBT soldiers are getting married on military bases, which is just remarkable. So I thank God that I lived long enough to see it. 
I'm privileged that I was part of that change. And what I say to my students and my colleagues, just pay it forward, open the door for somebody else. And so I wanna thank everybody here tonight so much for inviting me and remembering all of us who served. Thank you so much, Tanya, um, for sharing that incredible story and really inspiring words of leadership and um, you know, directive for what we can all do um, to make institutions better than what they, they were formerly. Thank you, Tanya, for joining us. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I will, I'm trying to find the chat here. I, oh, there it is. Sorry, I'm gonna put my uh, personal email in here in case there are people out there, vets that need help with some of the issues I talked about and feel free to call me or get in touch with me because everybody needs a helping hand from now, now and then. And I, I want to also thank Glenn Peterson and Isaiah James for being here. And I apologize for having to leave. All the best to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya. That's so generous of you. So I'm going to introduce our, our second panelist now, Isaiah James. Uh, who I'm so pleased to welcome here this evening. Isaiah is an alum of Baruch College. So welcome back, Isaiah. It's truly a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you so I, much for having me. Hey, thank you. Um, Isaiah earned his master's degree in public administration and our wonderful Mark School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, before earning his bachelor's and master's degrees, Isaiah served as an infantry squad leader for more than eight years, beginning in 2005. After earning his master's, he ran for Congress in New York's 9th District. He continues to work as a community organizer and since 2020 serves as a senior policy advisor for the Black Veterans Project, an organization that advances research, public education, and historical preservation addressing longstanding racial inequities across the military and veteran landscape. So thank you, Isaiah, for joining us this evening and for the incredible work and leadership you do currently. We're so honored to have you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Baruch and everybody who took the time to put this together. Um, like Tanya, <clears throat> you know, the reason why I chose to work with veterans and in the veteran landscape is because I never saw myself reflected in America's idea of the veteran. You know, that, that narrative has been co-opted by a certain type of person. And the veteran has been made to believe that they're this, you know, square jawed white male from middle America. And that's not always true, as we can see. Veterans come in all shapes and colors and sizes, sexual orientations, religious backgrounds, and socioeconomic statuses. So I didn't see myself represented it, represented in, in that landscape. So I chose to, to give back to the veteran community uh, after I finished my schooling. You know, and as you said, our organization works to correct some of those historic wrongs uh, that, that are out there in society now. Um, what I would say about this Veterans Day is, I think this is a special Veterans Day because we just got done with 20 years worth of war. And now all those veterans past are coming home and a lot of them you know, aren't really understood in society. And, you know, I'll just go into some of the work I do. I told the, the panel before we went live, uh, a part of my job is, you know, I work for a 501c3, so a part of my job is the senior policy advisor also to advance legislation. So I just spent the last week up on Capitol Hill meeting with, you know, Republican senators and Democratic senators, both of them. We met with 13 of each to advance legislation around toxic exposure and burn pits. And that's very critical legislation because we have thousands of veterans dying every single year because believe it or not, we can't get the, the VA to admit these soldiers were exposed, you know, to these toxic chemicals. And the work continues, you know, the, it, it's bigger than me. I want everybody to know that. It's much bigger than me. The work continues because a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind for veterans. You know, everybody says, thank you for their service. November 11th rolls around every year. We get a pat on the back. We get free pancakes at IHOP. Yet, you know, like I said, it's out of sight, out of mind. That that homeless guy you see on the street 
could be a veteran. That person struggling with suicide could be a veteran. That person who doesn't have housing could be a veteran. And if we can't take care of those who go in our stead, who go in our name, then as a nation, we are we are failing at the base at the basis level. You know, so I am I'm proud of the work I do. I'm I'm so glad that Baruch is taking the time to actually hear from veterans because a lot of colleges they don't do that. They just put something up on their website and call it a day. And I am proud to have gone to Baruch. And I, I'm proud to, you know, of my service. I'm not proud of everything that I did in the service, but I'm proud of my service. And I, and I just, I'm looking forward to a lot of the questions that people have, because I'm not a talker, I'm an answerer. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Um, we, we so appreciate your presence here and we will definitely come back to you with, with questions. So I now want to turn to our president, uh, the president of Baruch College, President David Wu, who I'm delighted to introduce. Uh, David has assumed office as president of Baruch a little over a year ago and has navigated us through one of the most tumultuous times in higher administration um, and his comprehensive vision of the region scope in public education more broadly how, and how that can be implemented and impact the lives of students and faculty in New Yorkers has already had a transformative effect here at the college. Prior to arriving at Baruch, President Wu held the position of Provost and Executive Vice President at George Mason University. And before that, he was Dean and Professor at Lehigh University. I think it's also appropriate to note here that President Wu served in the Taiwanese Armed Forces, an experience that links him to our student, faculty, and alumni veterans. Welcome, President Wu, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dean Lane, and uh, and good evening, uh, everyone. It is really an honor uh, for me to be here uh, with all of you. Um, and I also want to uh, thank our speaker, uh, Tanya uh, Domi and Isaiah James, uh, for being here tonight and sharing uh, your your experience and also very different perspectives uh, as veterans. And um, uh, and thank you, Jessica, for putting for hosting this event tonight. And I also want to extend my special thank to Beth uh, Harpes, who uh, uh, who has really, uh, in, in many ways, uh, helped organize this event. And which I who I happened to bump into her the other day on campus, and she was so excited about this event. Uh, and for all of you who are going to show up uh, here. And so uh, one of my duties to, is to uh, uh, introduce uh, Professor Peterson. Before I do that, uh, I, 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 I think I will uh, I jump in uh, to the mix and share a little bit with you uh, my own experience. Uh, as, uh, as Jessica mentioned, I served uh, in the Taiwanese Navy uh, when I was a, a young man, actually right out of college. And, uh, and this is a, uh, a mandatory military service uh, in Taiwan for all males. And um, uh, with a lock of a draw, I, I, I served two years uh, on, a, on a Navy frigate, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, a frigate is a warship, uh, basically with a, a mixture of different kind of armaments. Uh, and typically a frigate would serve on these uh, convoy escort uh, missions uh, for uh, supply ships and so on. So uh, back then, which is about 40, uh, over 40 years ago, uh, the Taiwanese Navy, uh, naval vessels are primarily World War II uh, US Navy ships. And uh, my frigate is, is no different. Uh, I, I, my primary assignment um, uh, was in the ship's uh, executive officer's office. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of my duties was to translate the U.S. Navy uh, operating manual from English to Chinese. And, um, um, and as many of you can relate, uh, in addition to my primary assignments on land, I also have my, uh, uh, my positions uh, when the ship is at sea. Um, and uh, typically, the ship uh, would be, the frigate would be uh, carrying out these uh, convoy escort missions on the Taiwan Strait um, and uh, just give you a little bit of a geography and Taiwan Strait is uh, about 110 mile wide strait uh, separating uh, the island of Taiwan and mainland China. And, and of course the defense force uh, in Taiwan is primarily to defend uh, against uh, uh, a communist China um, uh, uh, at that time. So my, 
my standard cruising duties are in the radar room. Uh, and, uh, but when we are in combat positions, uh, which is whenever, whatever happens, whenever we encounter a mainline Chinese battleship, um, and my, my battle position will be on deck uh, in one of the weapon systems. And back then, whenever we are in combat position, we would, uh, you know, have missile pointing at each other and uh, in really full combat position. Um, and ironically, uh, you know, 40 some years later, uh, you know, most of my contemporaries um, uh, are commuting uh, between Taipei and, uh, and Shanghai, uh, and, and just the world has changed uh, really uh, so much in, in just 30, 40 years. And while my experience may have very, may be very different from most of yours, uh, I'm sure there is uh, also a lot in common. Uh, and my, my military service did uh, teach me a lot of things, and, when, uh, and, and one of which is uh, as human beings, we actually uh, need very little to survive. Uh, and of course, in the military, you kind of have to uh, endure all, all various different kinds of situations, in, including uh, very limited uh, uh, resources. And I certainly learned a lot uh, from that experience. And compared to most of you, my military experience is very short. But what it does is it does open a window for me to to appreciate and relate uh, what you have done and what you have experienced and which I, I consider uh, really a gift. And, and, and with that, I really want to thank you for, uh, for all the veterans here tonight for your bravery and your self-sacrifice um, in defending the foundation ideas of our country. And I know what that, what that um, entails uh, and I can, I can really appreciate uh, what, you're, what you've gone through and although what I've gone through myself is nothing compared to, to most of yours. And then with that, I, I also want to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Glenn Peterson, which I, I'm sure many of you are looking forward to, uh, to hearing from him. And he is um, uh, a professor of anthropology and international affairs at, uh, at Baruch. And, um, uh, and he's a professor of, of a liberal studies and anthrop anthropology at the, at the Graduate Center. Uh, as well, and uh, and Glenn has been teaching at Baruch since 1977, um, and um, uh, and and he has been with the Graduate Center since uh, 87, and he he teach uh, anthropology and, and geography at Baruch, uh, and at the Graduate Center he he teaches in the PhD program in anthropology and the master's program in the, uh, in liberal studies. Uh, where he specializes in international affairs. And he has certainly a, a lot of experience um, in, in, these, uh, uh, in, in these different uh, fields. Uh, many of you may have read it in, from his book. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate studies at, at, at Cal State Hayward and received his PhD from uh, Columbia. And, and now, um, uh, I guess one of the, uh, the, the reason for this gathering tonight is we are uh, celebrating his most recent book, uh, War and Arc of Human Experience. And he was gracious enough to send me a copy and I did read uh, most of it. Um, and he's um, uh, really uh, bringing back some, some, some memories uh, even for, my, for myself. And, and this is a little bit of a memoir and um, uh, uh, and that examined some 70 missions that he had flew in the US Navy during the Vietnam War and when he was only 19 years old. And, and the book uh, tra traces history from being a, a high school dropout um, and actually running from home and getting a PhD uh, at Columbia University and uh, where he was a, a, a Margaret Mead's last graduate student and becoming a and two, all the way becoming a parent and the fatherhood, he said in the book, um, uh, really in many ways um, unraveled the coping mechanism that had kept him going and uh, forced him to reckon with his wartime experiences. Uh, my own favorite part of the book was when he described a mission um, that uh, due to a navigation error, he, his plane ended up in the airspace of uh, Hainan Island uh, which is an island uh, controlled by uh, communist China uh, at the time. So, so his plane was actually being shot at by the uh, anti-aircraft um, 
uh, arsenals and, and and so on and so forth. And 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 this near death experience, I, I, I think, as he described it, may have motivated his writing this book. But only Glenn can tell you uh, about that uh, in terms of uh, what motivated him to to write a book and, uh, and 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 everything else that he wanted to tell you about about the book. So please welcome Professor Glenn Peterson. Thank you, David, uh, and thanks to everybody who uh, organized this. Um, I, I'm a Vietnam veteran, I was over 55 years ago. And yet, as I witnessed uh, what happened uh, a couple of weeks ago in Afghanistan, uh, it felt to me uh, like uh, we were seeing uh, exactly the same cycle unroll again. Uh, and, and I quite specifically wrote my book, uh, to uh, tell uh, veterans of Afghanistan and Iran uh, something about the long-term consequences uh, of war. I, I came back from the war quite sure that nothing had happened to me. Uh, and uh, I was very successful. And then uh, everything changed. Uh, and I've been dealing with that uh, ever since then. And uh, I, I, I also, in addition to Iraq and Afghanistan vets, you know, I address myself to my colleagues here at Baruch, uh, most of whom know how cantankerous I can be. Uh, and I, the book helps explain why uh, I uh, decided that I will never keep my mouth shut again. So um, I, I'm gonna read just a, a couple of paragraphs from uh, uh, the uh, opening of the book because they summarize the book pretty well. My daughter is here and I apologize to you, Gracie, when I say that the rug was pulled out from under me, it was because you had such an enormous impact on my life, not because it was anything untoward. Just as I reached 40 and had begun imagining that I'd weather most of the tough times, my daughter was born and I had the rug pulled out from under me. I was a tenured full professor teaching students I admired at a venerable university. Head of my department, well respected by my colleagues, and publishing a steady stream of professional books and articles. I had established myself. As I understood it, a lot of this could be attributed to how well I'd put to new use the focus I'd honed as a boy fighting in the Vietnam War. I'd learned to harness my inner drive and ambition with a set of practical behaviors and to keep everything else blocked safely out of mind. I was locked in. Until that is, I adjusted to fatherhood by admitting I was an alcoholic and letting go of the comforting crutch booze had long provided me. Then boom, the war came roaring back and it hasn't given me a day's respite since. My growing relationship with my daughter peeled back vast expanses of scar tissue and exposed a tangle of raw emotions. I found myself right back in the war, but this time I wasn't able to block out the turmoil. I don't know that it's ever going to leave me, and that's why I write this book, to tell veterans of more recent wars what may be lying in wait for them too. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, I'm an ethnographer, and I don't think of this book as a memoir. I think of it as an ethnography using the traditional methods of ethnographers participant observation. Uh, I wanted to explore uh, what led me to enlist at 17 and how the things that got me to join up shaped the way that I experienced the war and then how the ways that I experienced the war affected the rest of my life. That, that is, uh, to me, uh, the trauma of war, it, 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 there's, there's much in common, but it's also a very individual thing. And one of the things that I explore in the book that is, leaps out at me as I study my history is this terrible, terrible contradiction that to survive in combat, uh, one has to be able to, to focus laser-like on the task ahead and to block everything else. I could not have climbed into my plane every day and flown those missions. and, and Flying wasn't the worst of it. Working on maintenance 
uh, on heavy uh, radar equipment on an aircraft carrier flight deck was even more terrifying in many ways. But I was able to do that by blocking out everything. And it worked. It worked really well. And, and the veterans that I talked to today described very much the same thing. The problem is that you then assume that nothing much has happened to you because you ignore what's happening. And you also notice how successful you've been. And so you come out of the military. Uh, I came out quite cocky. I, I, I had done it. I knew what I could do. And you know I raced through my education and got my job and everything was great. And, and then one day I'm nursing a newborn infant in the middle of the night. Uh, and uh, there's an article in today's Times about uh, the impact that uh, fatherhood can have on a father's brain. Uh, and, and it's clear as I trace the story back that that is what happened to me, that um, there was something about taking care of Gracie that uh, ripped the scar tissue off and uh, opened me up to the war. And when that happened, uh, and I could no longer deny it, I had to start uh, dealing with uh, this turmoil that, that, that never goes away. And I see it here with my student veterans at Baruch, uh, most of whom uh, tell me uh, that they're okay, right? And I understand that. And the more that a veteran tells me that he or she is okay, the more I doubt it because uh, that's exactly uh, my experience of being able to cover this up. I wanted to, to talk uh, a little bit about a couple of other elements. Um, one is uh, that I grew up watching war movies and had a very clear idea of war, what war looked like. And because I wasn't out in the rice paddies, uh, I didn't think anything had happened to me. Uh, and uh, what I came to understand and what I've written about in this book is what I call everyday danger the kinds of things that happen day in and day out that threaten your life, that build up, I call it lamination, layer after layer, and they become solid. And I can't make them go away. I, those everyday activities now haunt me in my everyday act activities 55 years later. Uh, the war is constantly the background for things that I'm doing. And I think the last thing that, that I'll talk about is uh, in some ways, uh, the most intellectually puzzling for me. Uh, I'm a thinker, it's what I get paid to do. Uh, and I have read at great length uh, in various kinds of literature. And it, it's taken me uh, most of my life to be able to understand this dilemma, which is that I feel terrible, terrible guilt for having fought in a colonial war in Southeast Asia. Uh, and played a key role in, in killing uh, hundreds of thousands of people in North Vietnam and millions of people in South Vietnam, I, I bear that responsibility. Uh, and and I've, people tell me to let it go. People say, well, you were just following orders. And I say, yeah, well, that's what the Germans said. I grew up with that and it doesn't get me off the hook. But at the same time, I look back at that boy of 19, <laughs> And I see what I did. I risked my life every day and something I believed in at that time. And I want to take pride in who I was, what I did. And that is a profound contradiction that I have struggled with for decades is how can one feel guilt and pride about the same activity? And it just shut my mind down. I taught a course with a, a psychologist uh, at Baruch, Glenn Albright, on the, the material as I was writing this book. And as a psychologist, Glenn kept saying, what's the problem? It's, of course, people have contradictory ideas in their head. And I said, yeah, but it, it doesn't work for me. And finally, after writing this book and, and, and thinking through every step of the way, what I came to conclude was that the only way that I personally, and I'm not gonna suggest this holds for other people, but it may help other people. The only way that I personally can feel pride in what I did then 
is if I understand the continuity, that the boy that I was then who was doing the very best he could is the man that I am now, and the man that I am now must take responsibility, full responsibility for what I did. My generation is known for resisting the war, at least as much going. I could have resisted the war, and I didn't. And so uh, in order to hold on to that little glimmer of pride in my willingness to serve, I have to do the same thing today. And that's why uh, every day of my life is in one way or another devoted to atoning for that war. And certainly my profession as an anthropologist has been to help a American colony in the Pacific become independent. And I represented them at the UN. And I thought that would end the guilt and it didn't. It's permanent, just like the PTSD is. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Glenn. Uh, and thank you for you know, investing yourself in writing this, this important book that um, you know, many, many people can, can benefit from. Um, I want to take a moment and just see if I can call on two younger members of our veteran community. Um, I first wanted to ask Roy Kintuna if he might be willing to turn his camera on and share some thoughts with us. I see, Roy, I see that you're among our audience members. Um, and and J Jacob, I also am going to invite you momentarily. Um, thank you so much for volunteering and for raising your hand. Um, Roy, are you sitting at your computer now? Okay, so maybe Roy will join us in a moment. So let me turn then to Jacob Michaels. Thank you, Jacob, so much for, um, for volunteering and for attending this session. Um, I, Jacob, I understand that you're a recent alum of Baruch and we're so grateful to you for, for, um, for showing up today and for your willingness to share your experiences uh, as, as, a, as a recent alum and as a recent veteran. Um, so I think my colleague Anthony is going to unmute you uh, or give you permission to unmute. There we go. There Thank I am. You. The floor is yours. Well, if, um, if there was doubters in, in the call, if veterans had a shared experience, I'm gonna give you uh, a near copy of what Professor Peterson just said, just from my experience uh, having separated just two years ago. Uh, like Ms. Lang just said, uh, my name is Jacob Michaels. I'm a senior at Baruch. This is my uh, last semester, double majoring in poli sci and philosophy, double minoring in Japanese and psychology. Also a US Navy veteran. I served from 2010 to 2019 as an anti-terrorism force protection specialist, as well as working within the nation's intelligence community as a cryptologist and fusion analyst. All this just means is I'm very skilled at standing in one place, scanning the horizon, and I can make a solid PowerPoint. Uh, this year marks the first Veterans Day that the United States has not been at war in Afghanistan since I was nine years old. And I'm sure there are many on the line, like myself, that went through the summer watching videos and seeing pictures wondering, what was the point of all this suffering? And was it all a waste of time? It's not the first time I'd asked that question. 11 years ago, when the war was only nine years old, I asked it to perhaps the worst person I could have, my drill instructor. After the verbal and physical barrage ended, my older and wiser bunkmate informed me, that's maybe a question for college, man. Maybe I'd made a mistake by joining. And that was kind of how the next decade would go for me. Seemingly caught in the middle of a middle-class, white, middle America childhood that said, we are the good guys doing good things to help people. And then hearing firsthand stories of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, and the overreach of an agency that I'd soon come to work for. But I also knew sailors who had subjected themselves to radiation to help fish bodies out of the water after the Fukushima natural nuclear disaster. Sailors who had helped do humanitarian work on missions to Haiti. I'd watched on the flight deck of the USS George H.W. Bush as the first strikes against ISIS left our ships one quiet summer night in 2014. Was the Navy, as they say in their commercials, a global force for good? Or did I devote my late teens and 20s to an organization that only helped to stoke the fires of imperialism? After nine years, seven duty stations, and a collection of prize sea stories, I finally made it to college. I got to ask my questions from brilliant professors like Claudia Halbeck, Corey Evans, and David Lindsay. I learned terms like hegemony and grand strategy about blowback and the close relationship that the Saudi royal family has with the United States government. What I also learned was that I played a very tiny role 
in a very large machine that was designed to recruit young, lower and middle class boys and girls just like me, that the military is one of the best ways in which a young American can raise their social mobility, and that the moral failings and choices of the officers and politicians controlling the US military over the last two decades, both elected and unelected, that led into ideological forever wars do not reflect and define my own choices to work with and for my fellow man. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob, for those comments. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, and now Roy has chatted with me. He's available to speak. He's having some trouble turning his camera on, um, but I'm hoping that Anthony, oh, there he is. Wonderful. Good to see you, Roy. And Anthony's going to give you permission to unmute yourself in a second. Oh, I think it's already muted. There you go. Welcome. Thank you so much oh. for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jessica and Beth, for inviting me um, to this event, and especially to all those who have orchestrated this event. Um, my name is Rick Quintuna. I'm currently a senior um, here at Baruch College studying intercultural and international communications with a minor in Spanish. I am a first generation college student. Um, I'm also enrolled in as an officer candidate in the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps program. So meaning that I am not a veteran, but I am on my way to commission as an officer in spring of 2022. My assigned AFSC or my job position will be air battle manager um, assigned to provide strategic overall roles within the Air Force uh, more specifically um, and more highlighted probably the specific and as well as in hotspot areas such as the Middle East and Germany. Um, overall, I'm a first century college student. I grew up learning and hearing veterans from all walks of life. My parents immigrated from Ecuador to the United States a long time ago. My father during the era of Ronald Reagan and my mother during the era of Bill Clinton. These two very specific and different political standards have kind of dictated the overall experience that my father, my mother had here in the United States. However, through all those tragedies and through all those experiences, I fell in love with just the overall arc of the military. I had a feeling that I wanted to go fly. I asked my father at a young age, um, hey, dad, I, I want to go fly one day. I want to be a pilot. And he, his immediate reaction was, son, that's great, but I can't help you. I'm just an immigrant. I have no connection whatsoever. You're on your own. Um, from there on out, I think it was, it was mentioned earlier that, of course, it, the military had targeted and had helped out um, really lower class and uh, um, middle class citizens. But to me, it was always a pathway forward, especially for my family who had fought in, in, in Ecuador as a prior servicemen and women. Those kind of pathways kind of enlightened me and made me fall in love with the story of veterans such as yourselves. And I am beyond grateful to the veterans now, past, and in the future of the service that you all bring to this country and as well as the experiences and the guidance that you bring over. Um, I'd like to share a quick story about just my overall experience in Air Force ROTC. Um, I'm just one of a few members in um, ROTC in Baruch College. And I am right now commissioned. I'll be one of the very um, recent grads to actually commission from Baruch as a second lieutenant um, in the Air Force. Through my experience in uh, ROTC, one of the biggest things as an officer is, and what I would love to hear more about from veterans and kind of the advice leading forward to being leadership is to always listen to people who are always in the field of operations. So such as like NCOs and people who have had more experience than myself. And I always value that, especially in a category where it's, you're the new guy on the block. No matter if you're coming here from college, it's always humbling to hear the experiences and ideas of others. I appreciate it and in this room and especially this from Brook College that has allowed this kind of foster and community to kind of come together and highlight within this campus. So thank you very much. Roy, thank you so much for those words and for sharing with us your experience as 
an Air Force ROTC student, um, which is just really inspiring and speaks to the diversity of experiences that our students have here at Baruch. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I want to now invite my colleague and friend, Dean Art King, Dean of Students at Baruch College, to say a few words. Um, so Anthony is going to help you turn your camera on, uh, Dean King, and your mic on. And there you are. Wonderful. Oh, Thank good you. afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Lang. It's so exciting to be here this afternoon to hear all the stories of all the, those who have served and those who continue to serve. You know, we here at Baruch, uh, we have our veterans lounge and we have a veterans program that we want to make sure that we support our student veterans. As a matter of fact, we are uh, in celebration of the liberties that they provided us and the freedoms that we have here in our country today. Um, we have, uh, we've been giving out all day uh, packages to our veterans to show our appreciation uh, for all that they've done for us. And so we have a few others left in the office. We just wanna make sure that all of our veterans come by, uh, student veterans and veterans in general, just come by the office of the Dean of Students and grab one of those. It's a small way of showing our appreciation. Um, you know, we do a lot of work here on campus to make sure that our veterans are, are sort of part and parcel of our community. Our last count uh, before we went into the pandemic showed that we had 151 student veterans on campus, and those are the ones who are actually going through and benefiting from the GI Bill. But there are probably lots of other uh, veterans who have not identified themselves. It's interesting to hear uh, Professor um, Glenn Peterson and his, his story, and, and Glenn has shared much of his story with us and with our veterans, and he's made himself so much available to, uh, to, uh, to offer support to our student veterans. As a matter of fact, he's a huge advocate for all that we've been able to accomplish here on our campus for our student veterans, and there's still a lot of work that we still have to do, and Glenn knows that very well, and he certainly uh, reminds me and my staff very much that we need to do more. We need to do a lot more for our student veterans, but veterans in general, and so it's so, uh, it's so gratifying to see that we have over 60 something people in the room uh, today uh, in honor of celebrating and thanking our veterans wherever there are um, many are, of whom are already graduates of this institution. So uh, thank you for organizing this and thank you for the service that you provided us. And I, I, I just, all I can say is, you know, uh, make sure that, the, particularly the student veterans, make sure that you utilize the services, all that we have to offer here on campus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean King. So we're now gonna to turn to some questions which have been uh, filtering through the pipeline. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to invite Isaiah and Glenn to respond to them, but, but Roy and Jacob, um, should you wish to respond, I invite you to reflect on them as well. So the first question is for Isaiah. Um, and the question is, how receptive are government officials to your efforts to improve the lives and outcomes of veterans and specifically black veterans. And the follow-up question is, what does your advocacy look like? Uh, how receptive are they? Uh, I'm gonna be blunt. Some of them are, some of them say they're receptive and many of them aren't because there's always the, the, the thing they talk about is the price, the price of this, the price of that. You know, it, it costs too much. So I'll give you a little bit of background. There's two bills we're trying to advance right now. One is called the Warfighter Act, and one is the, the Toxic Exposure Act uh, for veterans who are exposed to particulate matter and toxic exposure via burn pits while in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so a lot of the senators and their staff, their chiefs of staff, they always push back with the cost of this. And I always try to frame it as, this is not an additional cost to war. This is the full cost of war. You know, it took Vietnam veterans about 30 years for their health care to catch up with their claims. And we cannot afford to have that, you know, with this generation's birth of veterans. Um, one of my friends, his name was uh, Staff Sergeant Wesley Black. On Tuesday, I was doing a, a national uh, radio show talking about veterans issues and Sergeant Black called in. He informed me that he was going into hospice care. He had about three to six months to live. He's 35, just like I am. On Sunday night, I got the call that Sergeant Wesley Black passed away from, this, from these very particular cancers. And if you know, we're the fittest of society when we go in the military. And it's very strange that we're having all these particular cancers. And I try to frame that to 
the legislators when I meet with them because for some reason cost seems to be the, the major thing in their mind. So some of them are receptive, but a lot of them aren't receptive. Government is a leviathan and it doesn't move, you know, at the pace that quite frankly, we need it to move because veterans are dying. Um, with respect to my work in Black Veterans Project, I I believe it's I believe it's being received, you know, as well as it can be. A lot of times when you bring race into something, people automatically shut off and retreat to their corners. But I believe that we're in a time now in America where we can have that conversation about race even more so because we have a more diverse population. And not only that, we have social media and the internet that connects us. So people under, people are starting to understand that you can't run from the conversation about race. And if you know American history, which I'm sure everybody here does, we know America has a history of not doing things for people of color. And that is no different than in the military. When soldiers came back from World War II, when they were getting off the ship and going down the gangplanks, it said white soldiers one way, colored soldiers another way. You know, soldiers coming back from World War II were lynched in their uniforms. Black men were lynched while wearing their dress uniforms. So we have a very ugly history in this country. And I am proud to be working to address that history and those inequities and racial disparities in the military. One of the things we're doing right now, it's a pretty big project. We're actually, my organization is actually suing the Department of Veterans Affairs for you know benefit obstruction, benefit data and benefit obstruction data leading all the way back to the Civil War. And we have a very prominent law school, I won't say the name, but it's the number one law school in the company, in the country that is handling our litigation. And we also have another very prominent school that is handling the data collection and all that stuff. So I hope that answers your two questions. Um, but I, I believe that the work that we're doing with respect to Black Veterans Project on that side is being received very well. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Um, I wanna ask a, a question that kind of links to this, Isaiah, and then also I think Glenn and Jacob and Roy may, may also have um, thoughts about it. Um, but there, there's, this, is, this is a broader question and it comes up with a, a few, a version of it has been present, presented by a few different people. How can those of us who have no psychological training or no other kind of veterans oriented training support our veterans um, as they deserve. And that's kind of broad based, all veterans, all wars. Well, the, I mean, veterans are people too. You know, you, you don't have to get into the minutia of trying to deal with somebody's, you know, psychological problems or psychological issues that you don't have to do that. You can just ask them how they're doing and, and be there for them. You know, a lot of veterans just need an ear to listen. You know, you know, a lot of veterans and myself included. So I didn't go into my background about my service uh, when I first spoke. So I'll give you a little bit of background and tell you a little bit, tell you an anecdote about myself. I was an infantryman. You know, I was the combat guy on the ground, kicking in the doors and getting blown up and getting shot at. Uh, I have three deployments, two to Iraq and one to Afghanistan, 06 to 08, 08 to 9, and 2009 to 2010. So I've seen the worst of the worst and I've, you know, every bad thing you can think about has happened to me. And when I got out of the military, it was a, a bit of a, a culture shock. One day I was in the military and literally the next day I signed out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I was a civilian now with no help, no support system, no anything. And I was close to taking my life. I remember sitting, you know, on my bathroom floor with a bottle of sleeping pills and a giant bottle of alcohol and just sobbing uncontrollably, not wanting to be here, just wanting to shut everything off, excuse me. And as cliche as it sounds, the little voice in my head was saying, don't let this be a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And I went to the VA and I sought help and I got help and I'm still on the road to recovery. But for those who don't have any psychological training, just be that listening ear that the person needs. You never know what somebody's going through and you can just be that listening ear. as if you want to help on a broader scale, please, please, please call, write, annoy, beg, harangue, whatever term you want to use to your legislators, 
to make them understand that you, even though you might not be a veteran, you still care about veterans issues. The more public pressure somebody can put on an official, the more they are, more apt they are to act on a certain thing. So those are my two uh, levels of advice I could give somebody. Thank you, Isaiah. Glenn, did you wanna chime in here? Well, I, what comes to my head follows from what Isaiah was saying um, that uh, I think uh, the most important thing that people can do is to support uh, the VA hospitals. Uh, I depend overwhelmingly on the Manhattan VA hospital. Uh, you hear bad things about them, but the Manhattan VA is connected to NYU and Cornell medical schools and has top flight medical people there. But more than that, um, I have a very, very high rating, uh, disability rating for post-traumatic stress disorder and for a number of other uh, service connected disabilities. And, and quite frankly, uh, the reason that I can function is that I'm heavily medicated and the VA provides me with that. And uh, absent that, uh, I'd be out uh, in the gutter somewhere. Thank you, Glenn. Jacob, did you want to offer something as our, I think, our youngest veteran? Uh, I'm, I'm right here with my fellow vets uh, in agreement. The, the VA is, it's such a contentious relationship um, because they, they give it and they take it away. Like I, as well as Professor Peterson, have a very high disability rating for the, the injuries and whatnot that sustained during my time. Uh, and without that, I would be destitute, really. Um, so that is one of the things that I'm like consistently engaging my congressman on. Um, because it, it's something that I want to, at least for my part, to know that they are keeping in their ear. Because outside of that, I, I mean, yeah, just listening to stories and just and, and being able to vent and talk about those experiences, those are great. But between those two things, it, it, there's, I, I, don't, I don't know what else to do. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're just about at the end of our hour, but before we, we conclude, uh, I just want to take a minute to, um, to to recognize, not only to thank, but to really recognize the, the incredible contributions and sacrifices made um, by those who have committed themselves to serving uh, the United States and, and possibly other countries as well here um, in, in the name of achieving something better than what is currently in place. Um, I, we, I know we have a lot of veterans present today um, and I just want to acknowledge your presence. If, if all of our veterans could raise their um, raise their their Zoom hands so we can actually put a name to to your service or yeah, give a thumbs up. Thank you so much, Ilya. Um, I, I just I want to be sure that we we recognize um, all present who have who have contributed in this incredible way um, to to what we all profit from. So. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, President Wu, did you wanna give some concluding remarks? Uh, yeah, no, uh, I guess I just want to uh, repeat my appreciation for, uh, for all the veterans here with, uh, with, with us here this evening. And I really enjoy listening uh, to our panelists, as well as uh, uh, all the additional uh, questions and sharing our experiences uh, that uh, from our students and from many, many of you. So uh, very much appreciate that. And uh, I learned a lot and, and I certainly uh, will do what we, we can uh, at, a, at the uh, at Baruch College to support uh, all of you, um, uh, the veterans, and whether you are on the faculty or our students and all the staff and, 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 and so on and so forth, and we certainly would uh, do our part. And, and thank you, Jessica, and uh, thank you, Beth, for uh, organizing this, uh, this event this evening. I think it's um, uh, really speak uh, volumes uh, in, in terms of uh, 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 putting our action where our mouth is and really recognizing our veteran in, the, in a very meaningful way. And I, I just wish that we could do this in person uh, before too long. Um, and, um, uh, and I just want to, again, uh, express my appreciation for uh, you putting together all this, uh, this event. Thank you.
Thank you, David. I also want to extend my thanks to our panelists, Tanya Domi, Isaiah James, Glenn Peterson, and to our two more spontaneous volunteers who shared their experiences, um, Michael Jacobs and Roy Kintuna. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. And uh, we do hope to um, be able to see you all in person soon. Uh, so I hope you have a wonderful evening and um, you've given us so much to think about and to celebrate and also to remember. Thank you all so much. Thank you.